Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to South Lake. We're excited you're here today. Why don't you stand to your feet? Let's worship our God. I was buried beneath my shame. Oh, yeah. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb. Till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my turn. Till I Break. 
break the chains. You're the only healer, the greatest ever made. Through the cross forgiven, everything has changed. Every new beginning is by grace. Up and alive in Jesus, into a life of freedom.
You can go ahead and have a seat. Philippians 3, 7 through 9 says this. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Paul writes these words to the church in Philippi, and if if you don't know a lot about Paul, you can learn something about him in the very first line he says in that verse 7. He says, whatever were gains to me. And when you think about that word gains, it implies that Paul had some things going for him. He had some achievements that he could be proud of, and that was true for Paul. Uh, Paul had a lot of of knowledge. Uh, He was a scholar, and at that time, he studied under one of the most foremost Jewish scholars of that day, a a guy by the name of Gamaliel. It would be like studying physics under Albert Einstein or studying computer science under Bill Gates. He knew the Jewish law unlike almost anyone else of his time. In fact, by the time Paul was about 21, it would have been like he had earned two advanced academic degrees. He knew so much about the law. And when he heard about these followers of a man named Jesus, he began to persecute them. He went after them. He threw them in jail. And it was because he thought that these followers of Jesus were perverting the law as he knew it. He believed that by following the law, by holding to all of the rules that were written, that's how you earn righteousness. And Paul did that almost perfectly. Uh, Paul was intent on following the rules before he met Jesus. And even though Paul was a Jewish scholar, uh, some of you probably know Christians like this. Uh, Christians that maybe follow all of the rules, they're, they're pretty sure of all of their positions, maybe they post lots of Bible verses online, uh, maybe they can even answer all of your questions about the Bible. They have a lot of knowledge. But when you get to know them a little better, sometimes you sense that something is a little bit off. Maybe uh, there's a self of self, sense of self-righteousness. Maybe they have a hard time looking inside and acknowledging their own shortcomings. Maybe they have a hard time forgiving. I think we can probably all point to people like this. We probably know some people like that. It's easy for us to look outward at other people, but sometimes it's harder for us to look inside towards ourselves and see where we see some of that in our own lives. And so this morning, what I want us to do is actually spend some time looking inward and asking ourselves, are there ways in which we're relying on our gains, on our knowledge, maybe even our attendance at church? And are we confusing knowing about Jesus with having a deep relationship with him? A lot of times we can confuse cerebral or head knowledge with having a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus. And I think it's because head knowledge is easy to measure. We can look at our attendance at church. We can even read the Bible. Maybe we can even participate in the journey through Philippians and learn about Paul and this church at Philippi. We can memorize Bible verses. Maybe we can take notes every Sunday during the message. But sometimes all of that knowing and doing doesn't lead to any transforming in us. And so this morning, I want us to look inside a little bit. And I want to reread that passage that we just read from Philippians chapter 3, except I want to read it from a different translation. What I find is sometimes when you've read read the same words over and over again, it's like they wear these tire tracks in your mind and you can't get anything fresh or new from them. And so from time to time, I like to read from a different translation because it helps me to see God's word in just a little bit of a different new way. 
And so this is Philippians chapter 3, 7 through 9 from the Message Translation. The very credentials these people are waving around as something special. I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash, along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life. Compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master firsthand, everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. Dog dung. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I can embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. Paul says, compared to the high privilege of knowing Jesus firsthand, everything else is dog dung, it's trash, it's garbage. And this morning, I want us to focus on that one word, knowing Jesus firsthand, knowing him. How are you doing at actually knowing him, having a deep and intimate relationship with him? How are you doing at spending time with him, just like you would do in getting to know anybody else in any other kind of relationship? And this morning, I want to speak to two specific groups of people in our room. The first, those of you who maybe come here uh, every Sunday, but during the week, you don't get to spend a lot of time with God. And I want to challenge you in something that we call chair time around here. 15 minutes that involves reading scripture, praying, talking to God, and hearing from him. And if you come here on Sunday mornings, but you go through your weeks without really getting to know him, Maybe your next step is setting your alarm. Even now, setting your alarm on your phone for tomorrow morning so you get up and spend 15 minutes with him. And then I want to speak to another group of you. It's those of you that are sitting here that maybe you do spend time with God every day. Maybe you get up and you pray and you read scripture and then you kind of go on with your day. And what you're finding is your faith has grown a little bit stagnant. Maybe you're just not having that same sense of fire and intensity. You're not seeing God really change your life that maybe he once did. And for you, I want to share with you something that's been helpful for me. Uh, When I spend time with God, and for many years I would wake up and I would read scripture, I'd pray, and then I'd go on with my day. And over time what I found was I was doing those things, but nothing in me was really changing. And instead of just rushing through, instead of just monopolizing the conversation with God, I had to create some space, some time just to slow down, some time to just hear from God, to sit in quiet and stillness. And maybe for you, if your faith has grown a little bit stagnant, you need to add some time in the morning of just sitting in space and giving time to God to speak to you. In this age of distraction and hurry where our cell phones are always within arm's reach, a lot of times we don't create time for God to just speak to us. And so for you, maybe that's what you need to do is add some time to your morning routine or go on a long walk and just give God a chance to speak into your life, to bring to your mind the things he wants to change and grow in you. And maybe you'll find your walk with him is a little different and you get to know him a little bit better. As we get to know Jesus a little bit better, as we give him space to meet us, to speak to us, to transform us, we're able to trust his plans when they don't make sense to us. We're able to find peace even when externally things are crazy and stressful. And we're able to have joy in the middle of uncertainty but it takes slow, unhurried, quiet time with God. And as he reveals a little more of his character to us, as we get to know him better, we find that he is enough for us. 
that he is enough and in him we can find peace and joy and hope no matter what our external circumstances look like. So this morning, I want to stand and continue to sing to the God who is enough for us.
Jesus, we are so incredibly grateful that you are our everything, that with nothing, we still have everything when we have you. We thank you that you are the provider. We thank you that you, you love us and you prove it again and again. God, thank you. Thank you for being enough. God, we love you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Matt Stennett, and I am, thank you, and I am the middle school pastor. I can't, I can't even get it out. You're just so excited. Uh, I'm the middle school pastor here at Willow South Lake, and This happens every time, and I swear, I don't pay these people to clap for me. Um, uh, as you are seated, why don't you turn to somebody around you, introduce yourself, and ask them if they've made the Christmas switch yet. All right? Find out, because I have, and I want to make sure I'm not alone. Well, like I said, my name is Matt, and I am the middle school pastor here. And at this time, I'd like to invite our service hosts forward to begin receiving this morning's offering. And I just want to say that if you are a regular attender, thank you so much for your ongoing faithfulness and your generosity to this church and moving God's kingdom forward. Now, if you are a guest with us today, I want to say uh, this is the only part of our service that is not for you. I want to encourage you to take a pass uh, on that basket as it passes by. Our hope is that our service is just a gift to you today. While they're receiving the offering, I have a few announcements that I would love to share with you. Uh, number one is this thing we do around here called Breakaway. Now, if you don't know what Breakaway is, uh, in middle school, we do two camps a year. We do Collide in the summer, and we do Breakaway in the fall. And I don't know if you've ever experienced a, a, a camp experience, but there is something really special about it. There's something special about getting, uh, escaping from our busy, everyday lives and taking a retreat and being able to kill the noise in our lives and maybe hear God just a little more clearly. And next weekend, we have Breakaway for our middle school students. And I'm really excited for it because I think God is going to speak to them in new and exciting ways. Uh, the thing that I love about Breakaway is that it is just our campus. It is just our students. So it allows us to intentionally craft a weekend just for them. We're going to be talking about uh, what it means to have an out-of-this-world faith. We're really going to dive deep with Jesus. And we tell our small group leaders, and this is the truth, you will build more community with your small group in one weekend of camp than you will in three months of consistently leading a small group on Sunday mornings. There is just something special that happens when we get away together and experience God in a new environment. So I am excited for that. And if you've been thinking about registering your student, or maybe you're like, this is the first time I'm hearing about this, good news, there's still time. 24 hours, that's, that's it. It closes tomorrow at 10 a.m. And so if you've been thinking about registering your student, or maybe you, you have a friend who has a middle school student, and they're looking to get plugged in, we would love for them to join us. And so you can register through the app or the website is there, uh, willowsouthlake.org slash breakaway. And we would love for you, uh, your student, to be able to attend with us. Speaking of camp, our high schoolers also do two camps a year. And they have one coming up called Blast. And that is at Pheasant Run in St. Charles. And all of the Willow campuses join together for this one for a weekend of incredible teaching, 
worship, and this year's theme is fight. And so they're, gonna be, they're not actually going to fight each other. There won't be an octagon or anything like that. But the theme is fight. And what they're going to be talking to students about is how to fight for their faith. How to be bold for God in today's world. And it's going to have a high focus on discipleship. And so if you have a high schooler who might be interested in that uh, or who you might be interested in forcing to go to that, um, <laughs> either works, um, we would love for you to register. Registration is open, and uh, we would love for you to do that. You can do that through the app as well. The last thing that I want to share with you is this incredible organization that we partner with uh, in Lake County is called A Safe Place. And if you don't know what A Safe Place is, basically they, at, at the crux and at the core of who they are, they support survivors of domestic violence. And we love what they do. We've partnered with them many times before. And often when survivors of domestic violence show up at the doors of A Safe Place, it's literally with nothing except for the clothes on their back. And so what we would like to do, what we're committing to do as a church, is we want to be able to provide a Thanksgiving meal for 20 families who are being housed at a safe place. And so what you can do is there's a table out in the lobby right on the other side of that wall in front of the big WSL. And on that table are two different cards. One card has one set of ingredients on it, the other card has a different set. You don't have to take both cards. You can take one. You can take both if you want. But we want to be a church that cares about our community and gives back. And so this is one way that we can be generous. Uh, and so I want to encourage you as you leave to stop by that table, grab a card, help provide a Thanksgiving meal for these families in need. Now, here's the great news. You don't have to cook anything right? All you have to do is look at that list of items and go to the store and buy them. So if you know how to drive and you know how to purchase something, you're in. You're good. You're qualified. So uh, all you have to do is go purchase the items on the list and then bring them back to South Lake next Sunday and we will take care of the rest. So hopefully you'll stop by that table and get some more information. Well, this time I want to invite Gina up to share an elder prayer request. Thanks, Matt. Uh, just for the record, the only time to start celebrating Christmas is after Thanksgiving, okay? One holiday at a time, right, guys? Thank you. Thank you. I know the students have already made the switch, but I'm just saying for the record. <laughs> oh, booing over there. Well, many of you uh, may know that our elders are in the process of determining the next senior pastor for Willow Creek Community Church, and uh, their most recent update informed us that the Elder Search Committee planned to present two final candidates to the entire elder board during these weeks, and the elders are asking that we continue to be praying for them, for the candidates, and uh, just for the, that they would hear God's discernment and leading in this process, and so we're actually going to spend a minute praying right now together for the elders and uh, for these candidates. And there's two specific things I want to ask you to pray for. Uh, the first is for these candidates and their families. Uh, they're uh, potentially undergoing a huge transition and coming to Willow. And so we just want to pray that God is leading them, uh, confirming for them what God is calling them to do. Uh, and we're praying for their families that as they anticipate what this could mean for them, that uh, God would be with them in that process as well. And uh, we are praying that uh, these candidates would hear very clearly from God uh, what he wants them to do. Uh, the second thing we want to pray for is that God's will would be done and that our elders would have wisdom and discernment as they make this decision. Uh, we know that ultimately uh, it's God that determines the future of our church, that he has already determined who the next senior pastor is going to be. And so we just want to pray for our elders that they would hear clearly from him. And so right now we're just going to in silence pray and we'll, um, I'll give you a minute just to pray for those two things. And we'll put those requests up on the screen as well so that you can uh, keep those in front of you. So let's just pray right now and then I'll close us.
so God, we trust that your plans are good. They're to give us a hope and a future. And we trust that you already know uh, your plans for our church. And so we pray uh, for the person that you have chosen to lead our church in its next season. Would you uh, confirm for them in their hearts, confirm in their family's heart that this is where you are calling them. God, I pray uh, for this person's family, uh, that you would prepare them for the transition ahead, that you would be preparing a way for them. If they have kids, that you'd be preparing friendships and schools and community for this family. Uh, God, we just pray uh, for this next person that even now you would begin to stir in their heart uh, the things that you need and that you want to do in them so that they will be prepared for this next season of leading. And God, we pray for our elders. Would you give them wisdom? Would you give them discernment? Would you give them the ability to hear clearly from you, to, to tune out any of the other noise or distraction? And God, would you give them confirmation in what it is that you're calling them to do and the decision you're asking them to make? God, we believe that you've called our elders into their positions for a time like this, for such a time as this. And so, God, would you help them to hear from you? God, we trust you. Uh, this is your church, and we pray that you would lead her, you would guide her, and that you uh, would provide uh, who you want uh, to lead. And God, we just pray that you would help the rest of us to uh, just have open hearts and hands and minds. And that we would trust you too, fully, and lean into whatever it is that you want to do in our church. We love you, and we surrender and submit all of these things to you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we've been in this series through Philippians, and so today our acting senior pastor, Steve Gillen, continues in Philippians chapter 3. So let's go ahead now and join in with Steve in our South Barrington congregation. We're going to dive into Philippians now. We're in uh, this third chapter of Philippians. And if you're new to the church, or maybe this is the first week in a while, uh, the book of Philippians is a letter written by Paul, one of the early church leaders to the church in Philippi. It's a letter. It's not very long, just a few chapters. But it's got immense depth to it. And as a church, we've been learning about it, studying it. We've asked every person in the church, read it on your own. Just a couple verses at a time, every day. Talk about it in a small group. And then it the Sunday services on the weekend, we're going to dive into a deeper level. And this week, chapter 3 is where we're at. And what I'd love to do is read a significant portion of it to you. This chapter, really a beautiful chapter of Paul's writing where he's quite autobiographical and quite vulnerable about his own faith journey. So let me read this to you now. Here's what it says. Paul writes, if someone thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. As for righteousness based on the law, I'm faultless, he says. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage. That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, he says. Now, not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Forgetting what's behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 3. This chapter, again, Paul very vulnerably says, hey, real quick, two sides to my story. So I'm going to tell you my story, my faith journey. He goes, there was a time where I had faith before Christ, I had religion, and there was a time after Christ. And the two were vastly different. And then he describes this. And if I was going to lay out for you Paul's theology in just a few words, uh, I would just start with just a couple. Paul's theology in this is pretty clear. But he just starts out, if you really dive into his theology and want to understand it, Paul would start and he'd say, real quick, my whole life I believed there's a creator. Paul, from the very beginning, goes, I believe that this wasn't all chance, but there was a God who created all of this. Bible describes with a word, God created all of creation. 
except for one thing, uh, humanity. Bible says that for humanity, instead of creating us with a word, he created us with his own hands. He formed us with his hands. He breathed his breath into us to give us life. And the idea is that humanity has a special place in God's creation. You and I do. And then the Bible describes as well, and Paul believed this, that God gave humanity special gifts, one of them being freedom, choice. Bible describes, and Paul believed, that God gave you and I the ability to choose for ourselves, good or bad, right or wrong. We have the power to choose. And far too frequently, when given a choice, humanity has chosen evil. That's the second word. Now, evil is a really harsh word, isn't it? Like, that seems a little extreme. Sometimes the Bible uses the word sin, which just means you've missed the mark for what God intended for your life. But when you really get down to it, the idea is that on a moral standing, we, we have done evil. And if you read through the newspaper any point this week, I think you'll see evidence of this. That humanity, time and time again, chooses to do evil, to hurt each other, to harm each other, to kill, to deceive. We just have this propensity to do this. Now, here's the thing about evil. It's really easy to see this in somebody else, isn't it? It's really easy to see when somebody else is evil, when someone else does bad. It's way more difficult to see that it's in us. We have the ability to be self-deceived. But Paul believed that every single person on the planet has contributed to evil, every single one of us. In another letter he wrote, he simply says, for all have sinned, all have done evil, and fallen short of the glory of God. Meaning every one of us has fallen short of what God expected. We've all contributed evil. In this, something I see in people is many people want to figure out who are the good people and who are the bad people, right? Who's good and who's bad? And that's a deception in its very own nature. Paul would say every single one of us fall on the bad side. Now, there are safe people and dangerous people. That is a very good distinction. There's people who are trustworthy and untrustworthy. But when it comes to good or bad, the truth is we all fall on this side of the ledger. And this creates a problem for us. Because if there's a God who's perfect, and we have missed the mark with our lives and done evil, you have to ask the question, how do we get right with God? And that's the third word in this. This word appears in chapter 3 quite frequently, righteousness. It's just a religious theological word that means how do you get right with God? It means rightness, to be right, morally right in front of a perfect God. How, after you and I have been given choice and we've cho chosen evil, how do we then get right with a perfect God? Here's what's fascinating. Every major world religion all agree on those three things. Every world religion goes, there's a creator behind this whole thing, a designer who made us. Every one of them agrees that humanity has done wrong. Our ledger has read in it. And we have to get right before a perfect God in order to get into right standing. We all have to pursue righteousness. Paul's whole life has been spent on these three things. Understanding a God, understanding what he's done wrong, and in an effort to get right. And Paul's life demonstrates before Christ and after, the two different paths towards righteousness. If you look at Paul's life before Christ, it was devoted to doing works to get right. Works. He says in the last verse, you just heard it, when it comes to the works of the flesh or the law, he's basically saying, I was doing through my own effort good works to try to get right with a perfect God. Oftentimes with Paul's letters, he will lay out his spiritual or religious resume. He'll talk through the fact that he was devoted to religious learning. He studied immensely because he wanted to understand God and what God expected. He devoted not only to understand for himself, he then became a teacher to train other people. He was really an expert at this. He then tried to become an expert at understanding all of the religious rules so that anytime he broke one, he could make amends to get right with God. Devoted. In fact, the verse I just read you, he said that he was perfect. Nothing wrong with him. He did everything right. And then there was a point where he met Jesus. In fact, I love the phrase. He says the point was that he took a hold of Jesus and Jesus took hold of him. And in that moment, he caught a glimpse of a different path. Not righteousness based on anything he had done. But righteousness that was completely from faith. 
In the passage, he said it. He said, I don't have a righteousness of my own anymore. Not one that comes from the law, meaning all the works, all the following of the rules. He goes, my righteousness is not found in here. I'm not getting right with God that way. My rightness is now through faith in Christ alone. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Paul says, that day when Christ got a hold of me, changed everything. I got off the build my religious resume path and I changed completely to go, it's faith alone. Faith alone that I can find righteousness before a perfect God. Now you have to ask the second question, which is, what do you mean by this faith? Faith is simply a belief. It's a step. It's a risk, if you will. But what's your faith in? And Paul describes this in greater detail in another one of his letters. This one was written to a church in Corinth. And it says this, that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, what does this mean? When Paul says him who knew no sin or who had no sin, he's describing Jesus. The core belief is this, that all of humanity contributed evil to this world except for one, who's Jesus. Son of God came to this earth lived a perfect life. Paul would say his faith is that Jesus was who he said he was, the Son of God, the perfect Lamb of God. Him who knew no evil took on all evils, what it says. And the theological idea is that at the cross, what Jesus did at the cross was every person's sin from the past all the way to the future, all of humanity's, all that evil got put upon Jesus. He took it all on his shoulders when he went to the cross. He did it all. For every person, he paid the price for that sin and took it off your shoulders and mine. And that's a transfer, is what you'd call it. He transferred the weight of our moral wrongs to Jesus. Beautiful, isn't it? It's why so many people, they see a cross or they sing about the cross and they get emotional because they realize all the things we did wrong, he took on as a free gift. We didn't even ask him to do it. He gave this gift of faith. But then there's one other aspect. So you heard it that verse, that he who knew no sin took on our sin so that then we might have his righteousness. See, there's a two-way transfer in that moment at the cross. One was our sins absolutely went to Jesus, but two, his righteousness, his right standing before God, that he transferred to anyone who would receive it. He takes everyone's sin, but every person from there on has a choice would you take on his righteousness for yourself? Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. This, this is the concept that blew Paul's mind. Here he'd spent his whole life trying to earn his way back to good moral standing. He'd done all the studies, all the teaching, all the good works. And in the end, he's blown away that Jesus already did it all. Paul didn't have to do anything. Jesus himself through an act of faith, took on his sin and then handed him his righteousness. And the idea is this, that someday every single one of us will stand before a perfect God. Every one of us will have to answer for our lives the things we've done wrong. And every one of us will be asked, how are you going to get right with me? And Paul, before Jesus, would have had to stand there and say, look at all the good things I've done. And I hope it's enough. After he experiences Jesus, he realizes the day when God calls him to heaven, says, how do you make right the wrongs you've done? Paul's answer will be, Christ alone. Christ did it all. My faith is entirely in him. And the idea is in that moment when God looks at him, God will see Christ himself, not Paul. Does this make sense? That's this incredible transfer that we have in our faith. That by what Jesus did on the cross, our evil, our sins paid for. And then in making a choice to receive him, we receive this transfer of his righteousness for us. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's the thing that Paul could not get past the rest of his life. He's constantly thinking about who Christ was. He just wants to know him more because how possibly could someone be like that? How possibly could someone do that? So let me ask you, I told you, there was a day in Paul's life that made all the difference. A day where he said Christ took hold of him and he took hold of Christ. 
a day when he chose this faith, where he chose, I'm not going to try to work anymore. I'm just going to live by faith from here on out. He had a day like that. Let me ask you, have you had a day like that? A day where you just chose. I believe Jesus was who he said he was, the one who paid the price for evil. And I'm trusting, I'm trusting in faith that he will transfer his righteousness to me. Have you had a day where you've received that? The Bible describes every person, this is your choice. God will not force your hand. He'll allow you to choose. But his hope is that you'll choose this transfer. He's done all the work. Why wouldn't you receive it, right? Have you had a day? If you haven't, can I tell you, today might be that day. Maybe even right where you're sitting, you're sensing now, just like Paul did that day years ago, that God's getting a hold of you, and it's your chance to get a hold of him. Paul would write in another verse that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. All. He's basically saying this was done for every person, all of humanity. And all of humanity receives an invite. The invite is open, but you have to choose it. And he says, how do you do that? He goes, all you have to do is call on the name of the Lord. He's basically saying a simple, sincere prayer, heartfelt prayer up to heaven. God will hear that, and he'll save you. And my hope is every person who can hear my voice has had a point where you prayed that prayer. You just said, God, I believe in you. I own what I've done that's wrong. There's been so much evil I've contributed. And I don't want to work to try to get your righteousness. I received the free gift of grace that Jesus took all my evil. He transfers his righteousness to me. And now by faith, I believe and I receive. You pray that and the Bible describes all of heaven erupts. That what God has done for you, you've received that free gift of grace. And you do this, you, you pray this prayer, God says he saved you for eternity, and you go, well, is that it? Is that all? And one of the confusing things in this third chapter of Philippians is Paul, after he describes this, then begins to describe an ongoing pursuit. And it almost sounds like, is he still back on the works side, trying to earn his righteousness? And there's another, another word that we'll have to introduce in a moment. But again, to remind you, here's what the verses say. After he's already talked about his transformation and his salvation, he then says, now whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. I consider it all loss. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them all garbage that they may, I may gain Christ and be found in him. Again, he's reflecting on his life. And he goes, oh my gosh, all those works, everything I did, it's like trash. The image, by the way, it's so good in the Greek. The image is after you've had a meal, if you can imagine, you sit down for a meal and you eat everything on your plate, basically. And they're cleaning up and you look down and there's just a little bit of food scraps left. Not enough to save, mind you, right? You're not going to put this in the fridge. Just enough to kind of scrape into the disposal. That's what Paul says, compared to Christ, that's all the things he had done. It's the table scraps that you don't want to eat as leftovers. You just throw it away. That's where he valued these. That's how low all the works were. He goes, I can't believe I even spent my life trying to do this when I reflect on all that Christ did. But once he's received this, then he has these next words that describe, again, something that people get confused, that some people confuse Paul's trying to still work for his salvation, but it's not. I'll tell you about it in a second. But here's what he says. He goes, not that I've already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of them yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what's behind and straining towards what's ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which Christ has called me heavenward. So what's he talking about? He's already been saved. Why is he straining forward? What's he working on? What's he trying to accomplish? And there's one last theological word I want to introduce to you that is this concept. It's called sanctification. Now, this is a theological word. You may have never heard it before. But the idea of sanctification is once you've received his righteousness by faith, the work begins of your transformation. The idea of sanctification is once you receive grace, you aren't to be staying that person. God wants to transform you into the person you've always, he's always wanted you to be. So the idea is once you receive grace, then you begin the process of being changed and transformed. That's what Paul's saying he's straining forward. It's to be more and more in the image of Christ and more the person he's always supposed to be. And this is a difficult concept. 
So I wanna use a couple analogies to help you understand it. Now I'm gonna own, these are ridiculous analogies, okay? Oh boy, I'm, I'm getting concerned. All right, here you go, these are analogies. Here's what it is. Imagine you get invited to go on a boat ride, right? And you get on the boat and you're having the best time and you're just enjoying yourself and you're dancing, there's music, and you realize you're being a little silly but you're on the edge of the boat just having fun because it's a great day. And then you hit a little spot of water and you slip and fall in. And the boat continues to motor on, but you're in the water and you realize you are in trouble. So you shout out, somebody save me. And by a miracle, someone on the boat hears you. They grab a life preserver and they throw it to you. And you grab hold and you realize you've been saved. And someone says, do you want to get in the boat? And you go, no, I'm saved. I'll just stay in the water. <laughs> it's ridiculous, right? It's ridiculous. See, you've already been saved the minute that that life preserver hits you, but you don't stay in the water. They pull you in, and notice the people on the boat are doing all the work. They pull you in by that rope, then they lift you out of the water. They get towels to dry you off and get you new clothes, and they want to restore you, and they hope that you'll actually behave even better on the boat now that you know how dangerous it is to dance on the edge, right? <laughs> Second analogy. Again, these are ridiculous. I hope this doesn't happen, but let's just say on the way home today, you have a heart attack. Again, I hope that doesn't happen. You have a heart attack. They race you to the hospital. The surgeon comes in and looks at you and says, good news, you can be saved, but you're going to need surgery. So they rush you off. You have a couple bypasses. A few hours later, you wake up and the surgeon smiles and says, great news, I saved your life. You say, thank you, doctor. What a gift that you did all the work to save me. That's all there is, right? He goes, of course not. I, don't, I didn't save your life so you'd be laying in a hospital, but now you go to rehab for months. You've got to work diligently to get back into shape. By the way, you'll need to change your diet. More veggies, less Twinkies. By the way, you probably should exercise more. I noticed you haven't exercised in years. It's time to start. And here's the incredible news. If you'll eat healthy, do the rehab and work out, you actually can have a better physical body than you ever have. Your body will even be better than before you had the surgery. You can have the body you were always meant to, but it's going to take work. See, the minute that surgeon did the surgery, the minute that person threw that life preserver, you were saved. Same is true with Christ. The minute you say that prayer that you receive as grace, you're saved. But God says, don't just stay where you are. Now be transformed. Be sanctified. Become the person I always hoped you would be is what God's saying. And that's a lengthy process that is a lot of God's work and some of yours. To intentionally join him to be transformed. My experience and what Paul would teach. Oftentimes the sanctification work of you looks very much like this. That oftentimes sanctification begins, certainly there's a reflection on Christ and what he's done. And there's quite a bit of introspection to understand, where am I still sinning? Where am I still contributing evil? We all still do, even after we've received grace. And then you want to take that, confess it, to get right again. In this, so much what Paul teaches in three is he's constantly on an effort to understand Jesus more and more in his life understand his teachings and experience his presence, be transformed as he knows him better. So much of what he'll describe as study, reading the Bible, reflection. But one other aspect that's critical for Paul is community. Paul will describe practices that many Christians don't do. He'll describe confession. The Bible describes that you and I as Christians, we're to confess our sins to each other openly. We don't do that much. We like to be image uh, conscious and protect our image. We don't like to tell. We'll confess it to God, but I don't want to tell someone else. Can I tell you, you're missing out. One of the best spiritual practices in my life is with a few trusted friends. When I'll go to them and say, would you just for a minute listen to me confess to some things I did wrong? Can I just confess things? Because I, I need someone else to look at me and actually offer forgiveness. And I'll sit with a friend and I'll say, let me tell you what I did wrong. And I get to the end, and I said, could you just say a prayer for me? And most frequently, what happens is that friend says a prayer and says, Steve, you're forgiven. And then he'll say, hey, can I confess some things too? And you play this role where you're just trying to get clean. You're just trying to get right. 
You want to become more and more the person God intended. You don't want to live up here anymore. That's confession. The other side often is, is confrontation. My friends who have invited into a meaningful relationship where I'm asking them, help me become more and more like Christ. They'll have points sometimes where I haven't confessed this, but they see it and they'll just come and go, hey, Steve, you have a problem. There's something you're doing that needs attention. It's one of the best gifts. I tell them this, one of the times I feel most loved is when they'll do this. It, it, just, it just happened this last week. Uh, this last week, a friend, a trusted friend, asked for just a little time. And then they said, you know, something happened that really hurt me. And I, I don't think you're aware of it. I just want you to know about it. And then he described not something that I did. It was something I didn't do. And I realized through this incredible gift that I just had a blind spot. There was something that I was missing. And a friend was hurt. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. This isn't who I want to be. I'm trying to get better. I don't want to be this as a friend. I certainly don't want to be this as a follower of Christ. The Bible describes this act of sanctification. This is a lifelong pursuit. It's a lifelong effort. It doesn't happen in a moment. I wish it did. But it's an ongoing effort to go, I want to be more and more who God always intended me to be. I want to better and better reflect Christ to my friends and to my world and to my family. I want to better live out these teachings. This is where Paul goes, hey, you guys, I'm not there yet. Paul's very close to the end of his life. He goes, I'm not who I always want to be. It's, it's not complete. But I press on. I'm fighting to the finish. I'm working to the very end. He's basically saying, I'm nearing the end of my life and I can see the finish line and I'm not gonna slow down until I get to that place. I'm gonna strain all the way to the very finish for God and God alone to see myself sanctified as best I can. Friends, can I ask you? I already talked about one decision, making just a decision to choose faith over works and receive his righteousness. There is a second decision. Once you've done this, the second decision is now I'm gonna pursue transformation. It's a choice. It's a choice at a time, and it's an ongoing decision to intentionally pursue God's work to transform you. Now, here's the beautiful promise. Much of the world will say people don't change. The Bible completely disagrees with that. It says transformation not only is possible, it's expected. Once you receive grace, God says, I want to do this work. I need your help. But you watch. You will see me change you, transform you. You can be different. You can be. Overcome addiction. Stop patterns of sin. New ways of caring for others and loving and sacrifice for others. This is all possible, but it comes at a choice. Vulnerably, one of the great disappointments for me, uh, been a pastor now for 26 years, very disappointed that many times I'll see people choose this and years go by and there's no change. 20 years past, you go, man, you're still the same person, same sins, same struggles. They just didn't choose this. Don't you be that person. Once you've chosen this, pursue him. Go change me, God. Work in me. Point out my sins. Point out my flaws. Grow my love and my capacity for love. Grow how I care for others. God, grow me into the person you've always wanted me to be. You pray that prayer. I believe God will be faithful to hear it and begin that transforming work to see you sanctified into who God most wants you to be. Yes? But it's a choice. It's a choice. And my hope is every person here first makes this decision. I believe in this. I'm not going to try to earn my way back to God. I'm going to choose faith. I hope you'll make that call. Some of you, that might be today. Once you've done this, I hope you make this choice. I'm saved, but I'm not staying in the water. I'm saved, but I'm not staying in the hospital bed. I'm saved for eternity. Now let's get to the really fun work of seeing me transformed into who God always has desired me to be. You do that, I think you will see miraculous things in your life. So how are you doing with this process of sanctification, of allowing God to transform you, to change you into the person that he wants you to be? It does take some work. 
the work of uh, of being saved, that's what God did for us on the cross. That's a one-time thing. But this work of transformation takes choices on our behalf. And it involves things like spending time with God, reading his word, praying, talking to him, giving him space to speak to you, leaving space to reflect, to have some time of introspection and to think through the things in your life that need to change, that need to be different, maybe the things that need to be confessed. And it also takes community, people coming around you, helping uh, point out things in your life that may need to change, people to whom you can confess the things uh, that are wrong in your life and ask for help and accountability. And if you don't have a group of people like that in your life, I'd encourage you to stop by our info booth on your way out today. Uh, Let us help you get connected to a small group of people that can kind of come alongside you in this. But let's not stop at the work of just making the decision to follow Christ. Let's let God change us from the inside out. God is in the business of transformation, and we get to be a part of that. Would you stand as we close in prayer? And as you're standing, I just want to remind you that we have a fantastic prayer team. And if you came in here today carrying something, please don't leave without uh, some prayer. Will you bow your heads with me? God, we are grateful for your son, Jesus. That by what he did on the cross, that we're not left here in our sin, but by believing in him, by making the decision to follow you, that we can have life, a full life with you here and life in eternity with you. And God, we are grateful that you don't leave us in our sin, you don't leave us in our brokenness, but you desire to see us changed and transformed. You desire to do good work in us. And so even now as we're standing here, if there are things that you want to bring to our mind, things that we need to confess or make right, God, would you bring that to us? God, if there are things in our life that you want us to change, God, would you help us to humbly come before you and bring that stuff to you? God, would you do this work of changing us, transforming us to be more like you, to be more like the person you created us to be? And then I believe, God, the world will know uh, by our love that we're yours, by the way that we live and love and are changed, God, that we, uh, that God will, that people will see you in us and see your work changing us. And so as we walk out these doors today, God, I pray that you would give us space to spend time with you, to be in your word, to talk to you, and to hear from you. God, we're yours, and we love you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, everyone. Blessings.